Okay, uh, welcome to uh, Psych uh, 232. Today we're talking about the um, chapter eight, it's the trade approach to personality. Um, the trade approach actually seems to have started with Gordon Alcord that we just talked about before this, uh, where he talked about personality traits, but these guys are gonna take it further. Okay, we're gonna start out by talking about Cattell, whose picture you see there on the left, the first one, uh, the guy there with that, you know, with uh, that, that looks a little bit like Dr. Phil, right? The one that's bald and stuff. Um, that's Cattell. Uh, we'll talk about his theory and um, you know his approach to uh, studying personality based on traits, personality traits. And then we'll talk about Isaac, which is the second guy there. And then the others, um, I think that's Costa and McCray at the upper right. And then Buss and Plowman are at the bottom, those two little pictures at the, at the bottom right. Okay, so we're gonna talk about all of those. It seems like a lot, but it's really not. It's, it's, it's personality based on personality traits. It's, just, it's the personality theory versus some personality traits. There's actually gonna be several theories. We're gonna talk about four different theories, but they don't take that long to talk about. Cattell's is actually the longest. We'll talk about his first. So Cattell's approach to personality, okay? Um, before I tell you about Cattell's approach to personality, I need to mention something called factor analysis. Factor analysis is a statistical technique based on correlation for determining factors or traits. Let me explain that because this is what Cattell and a lot of these guys did. Uh, it, they use this thing called factor analysis. So they basically gave um, personality questionnaires to a bunch of people, hundreds, probably hundreds, probably not thousands, but you can give personality questionnaires to hundreds thousands of people, let's say it's hundreds, okay? And you have them rate themselves on, let's say how aggressive they are, how shy they are, how extroverted they are, how uh, welcoming they are, how nice they are, a whole bunch of different things, okay? And then you enter that into the uh, computer, right? Into the uh, software program, right? You enter the data and you use this technique called factor analysis that looks at how all these different, uh, basically personality traits, all these different descriptors of people you can say, how they are related, how they are correlated. And it turns out that some things are highly correlated. So they more or less refer to the same thing. Okay, so for instance, like let's say uh, being talkative and being uh, sociable and being fun loving and um, being gregarious, which means you like to be with a lot of people, all those things are related. So, so they form one factor or one trait, okay? Other things like, let's say, being shy, easily angered, uh, easily worrying, um, you know, uh, let's say, like, uh, being anxious, things like that, all go together too, and they would determine another trait. So basically factor analysis is, is a statistical technique where they look at the correlations among a bunch of different descriptors of people. And these descriptors can kind of be like personality traits, but they look at, uh, they look at how those things are correlated and they find out that they cluster into groups based on correlations. And those things that they cluster into are given different names. And that's Cattell's approach to personality. So when he looked at all these different groups, he called them different things. So he classified the traits in different ways. Um, some of them he called common traits, right? These are personality traits or traits that are shared by everyone to some degree. Like everyone has some degree of intelligence, for instance, some degree of extroversion, some degree of anxiety, things like that. He called these common traits. And there's other things he called unique traits. These are traits that are shared by a few people that distinguish, that, but that distinguish us, things that make us more unique, uh, things that have more to do with interests and attitudes, like liking politics. He called those unique traits. This sounds very similar, by the way, to Gordon Allport's theory, and it is, because Gordon Allport kind of did the same thing, okay? He looked at a bunch of different descriptors of people, a bunch of personality traits, and gave groups of them different names. Cattell's doing the same thing here. So unique traits are things that are shared by very few people, things that distinguish us a bit more, things that have more to do with our interests and our attitudes, like liking politics. And he also uh, gave another 
also came up with what he called ability traits. It's obvious what ability traits are. Ability traits determine how efficiently we work toward a goal. Ability traits have to do with how good we can do certain things, you know, or how intelligent we are, or maybe how good our memory is, or things like that. They have to do with our abilities. Common traits are things we share with everyone. Unique traits are things that kind of make us unique. Personal, you know, personality traits are things about our interests or attitudes that make us unique. Ability traits are things that basically have to do with how well we do certain things. And there's more, it's gonna get annoying after a while. He also um, distinguished with, uh, between uh, what he called uh, temperament traits. We, uh, I don't know, actually we haven't talked about temperament in this class. Another class we talked about temperament. Temperament is, the, is your general style, your, the emotional tone of your behavior. Temperament is basically, uh, has to do with uh, how emotional you are, how you uh, react to people, that kind of stuff. So he called that temperament traits. So how assertive you are, how easygoing you are, how irritable you are, you know, how anxious you are, things like that. Your temperament, there'll be a theory that we'll get to that has to do with temperament, okay? Temperament theory. Temperament, and according to that theory, is, is your basic personality at birth. It has to do with basically how emotional you are, how, um, you know, whether you respond to, to things intensely or not, how, uh, how accepting you are of, let's say, of strangers being around or not. That is temperament, okay? So he called that temperament traits, things that have to describe your general style, basically how you are and how emotional you are, the tone of your behavior, that kind of stuff, okay? And then he also uh, came up with what he called dynamic traits. Dynamic traits are things that, uh, you know, that drive your behavior, the driving forces of behavior. They define our motivations, our interests, and ambitions. Uh, they, um, there's two kinds that are called ergs and sentiments that we'll talk about soon, okay? But dynamic traits are personality traits. Are, they are things that drive our behavior, that motivate us. And there's two different kinds, ergs and sentiments, which we'll talk about in a moment. There's also surface traits. Traits that correlate with one another, right? That relate it to one another, but are not due to any one thing, okay? They're less important, not permanent. Like if you are, for instance, neurotic because you are, uh, you know, anxious, you're indecisive, you're fearful, right? So in other words, it's a, it's a trait, it's a personality trait that hasn't, doesn't have to do with one thing, but has to do with uh, multiple things. And he called those surface traits. They're not due to one thing, they're due to many things, okay? You can be neurotic, for instance, because let's say that's the way you are, you're anxious, indecisive, fearful, or you can be neurotic because of the situation, because you have to give a speech, and maybe that's why you are being indecisive and fearful and things like that. So he called those surface traits. And there's more, okay? Uh, he also came up with what he called source traits. Source traits are what he called unitary personality factors that are more important, important and permanent. So surface traits are things that are just on the surface, things that can, can kind of change, things that can be due to different things, those personality traits. Source traits are more important. They have more to do with who you are. They're more permanent, okay? Being conservative, uncontrolled, uh, being extroverted, being aggressive. I mean, it could be a variety of things. Uh, see page 217, it says, uh, that page is no longer accurate. That refers to a different book, and I, I didn't remove the page number. I'm not sure there's a page number on the book that you, you guys have that's an electronic book uh, that lists um, a lot of his source traits, but they could really be anything. Source traits are just personality traits, basically, that are more important and permanent, that are, have more to do with who you are. Not like source traits that have more to do with, you know, let's say, situations that can change or things that that can be due to different things, okay? Constitutional traits are a type of source trait that are due to biological conditions, not always innate, okay? Uh, so constitutional traits are source traits so that are not so permanent, not so much due to personality, but they are things that are due to your biology. Like for instance, yeah, you can be careless, talkative, because you are drunk. Your biology is being affected by this drug, so it is a biological condition, right? And it's a constitutional trait, being careless and talkative because you're drunk. 
So it's not necessarily innate, not something you were born with, but it's something due to a biological condition. Or let's say you're grouchy and irritable because you're tired. You weren't born tired, it's not innate. So he called those constitutional traits. And then they are, and there are environmental mold traits. Environmental mold traits are source traits, right? Remember, source traits are things that can vary, things that can be due to something, let's say, uh, that have to do with you, your, you know, your biology, or something have to do with the situation. They can be due to different things. Environmental mold traits, as the name implies, are source traits, right? Are basically traits or personality traits, basically, that have more to do with this physical and social environment. Things that have more to do with, uh, with what you're experiencing in the environment, right? They are things that could be learned, like learned traits. Like, let's say you have a conservative nature. You are conservative. If you want to use that as a personality trait, let's say, because you were brought up in a military family, it's part of your environment that you grew up in. Or maybe you're liberal because you were brought up in a different environment, in kind of a, an environment in which uh, it's more that, uh, you know, uh, you know, that hippie kind of environment, you know, where they believe different things. But in other words, it has to do with uh, your environment, right? So things that define you, that have to do with things that you've learned, that have to do with your environment. He called those environmental mold traits. Things that can define you, source traits, but they have to do with uh, think something you're experiencing biological. Uh, that is a constitutional trait. And by the way, these uh, constitutional traits, environmental mold traits, are both source traits. So that tells you a little bit more about source traits, that they can be doing something biological or something environmental, but they are not really permanent, okay? They are things that can vary. So they are things that can be due to different things. Whereas source traits, uh, actually, no, source, I'm getting confused here. Here, Source traits are things that define you a bit more, that, that are more permanent and important. And they, you know, and, and constitutional traits, and environmental mold traits are a type of source traits. I was getting source traits confused with surface traits. Surface traits are less important and can be due to different things. Okay, so yeah, no. So uh, constitutional traits, environmental mold traits are all, are all, they're all source traits. I was getting confused because source and surface sound different, sound similar. Okay, and he also um, talked about dynamic traits. Remember, we talked about dynamic traits already. We mentioned them. Dynamic traits are, are personality traits, basically, uh, that motivate behavior, motivating forces, okay? And they come in two forms, ergs and sentiments. Ergs, we're talking about things that are instinctive, right? An instinct or a drive. It says that is the basic unit of motivation, a type of constitutional trait. It's a type of constitutional trait because it's biological, okay? But ergs are instincts or drives. These are things that you can't help that are just part of who you are biologically. And there are things that motivate your behavior, like anger motivates you to want to hurt somebody. Hunger motivates you basically to want to eat. Sex motivates you to want to reproduce, right? To have sex, right? Um, sexual desire, that is. Uh, and he mentioned other things that are a little bit less, um, uh, less I would feel a little bit less like instincts. I could see curiosity as being instinctive, but appeal, you know? Uh, disgust, yes, that's instinctive. Gregariousness are basically because we want to, um, let's say, uh, be with others and uh, be around others, socialize with others. That's gregariousness. Uh, you can see how that is part of our nature, just part of who we are. And that's to do with our biology, right? Our, our genetics and just the way the predispositions we have that are biological. That drives our behavior. We want to be with others. We want to hang out with others. We want to party. We want to talk to people. That's gregariousness. Uh, protection, I guess that would be self-protection, right? Which is related to security, self-assertion, right? Standing up for yourself or even submission. Uh, sometimes we tend to submit uh, under certain conditions and it could be instinctive, like as a way to protect ourselves, right? We submit so we don't get hurt or something like that. But ergs are basically things that are instinctive that drive our behavior. Basic biological drives, you can think of them as, you can think of them as that. And an erg is a type of dynamic trait. We also have other dynamic traits uh, that he referred to as sentiments. A sentiment is a learned attitude, right? It's something you've learned. Learned attitude focus on something about the community, something about your spouse, your occupation, religion, your hobby. It's something you learn. It's a type of environmental mold trait. It's something that has to do with the environment. Maybe your preference for a certain political party, right? Whether it's Democrats or Republicans, that's a sentiment. That's something you learn. 
or let's say the fact that you have a photography ha photography hobby, you know, and you like to take pictures, that photography is a hobby for you. That's also something you've learned. Or the type of bank account you prefer, checking, savings, an investment account or something like that. That's also learned. Your belief in God, right? All that is learned. He called those sentiments. Um, so these are all dynamic traits, ergs and sentiments. And um, let's talk about other dynamic traits. There's other things also that motivate behavior. Uh, your attitudes, right, are also dynamic traits. Attitudes are uh, interests, emotions, behaviors toward a person or object, okay? So attitudes are basically, um, they have to do with how you feel about certain things again, okay? Um, but uh, with more about, uh, about like objects, you know, your interest in a film, your attitude toward taxation, things like that. So attitudes are, you know, you can have an attitude like I like ice cream, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so motivation you to want to eat ice cream or your emotions, how you feel, let's say about uh, abortion, that's an attitude, right? Or your behavior to a certain person, right? Maybe you dislike politicians, right? Uh, you dislike, uh, let's say, um, I don't know, environmental waste or whatever it is. Those are all attitudes, okay? They also motivate your behavior, but they are what we call attitudes. Okay, um, so attitudes imply that you think something is good or bad, you know, uh, that you like it, you don't like it. Those are attitudes. Subsidiation is just something that refers to um, how things are related, like relationship among ergs, sentiments, and attitudes, okay? Because they're, they, they are similar. They're all dynamic traits, but how are they related? Okay, so I'll give you an example. So the erg is basically that biological motivating force that you can't really help. An example of that would be sex, right? It's a very strong biological drive, right? It's an erg, it's, it's a dynamic trait. It's something that motivates your behavior. Uh, that drives your sentiment to, toward your partner. You know, the fact that, you know, you like your partner, for instance, and you want to be with your partner, right? That would be the sentiment. And then that drives, you know, how you feel about your partner's hairstyle, which would be more of an attitude that you like his hairstyle or her hairstyle, or maybe you dislike it. You're more likely to like it because it's your partner, right? Because the way you feel about your partner affects how you feel about their hairstyle. So sex is the biological thing that motivates you right? Motivates you to find a partner and you feel a certain way about that partner. That's the sentiment. And because you feel a way about that partner, that affects how you feel about your partner's hairstyle. And if you like your partner, you're probably okay with their hairstyle. You probably like their hairstyle. You know, this, you know that might have something to do with why you're attracted to them in the first place. And actually, when you meet people who are similar to your partner, uh, you're more likely to find them attractive, actually, because maybe they have the same hairstyle or they look similar in some way. So first we have the erg that's very dominant, very powerful, right? And that affects, you know, the sentiment and then the sentiment affects the attitude. That's what we're talking about. He called that subsidiation where some things are basically below others in terms of influence. Okay, that's what he meant by subsidiation. And then there's your self-sentiment. Your self-sentiment is basically how you feel about yourself, your self-concept and your attitude toward yourself, okay? That's your self-sentiment. Self is self, right? Sentiment means how you feel. So how you feel about yourself, that's your self-concept, right? And what you think of yourself. It organizes all your attitudes and motivations. What you think of yourself, right? That you're a certain kind of person, right? And you like certain things and you don't like other things. It also includes your self-esteem, how you feel about yourself. That's your self-sentiment. It's what you think about yourself. That's your self-sentiment. I want to point out that there's a bunch of labels here and that they are confusing, okay? Um, and Cattell is calling all these things personality traits. Because of factor analysis, because he looked at all these different things and it put things into different groups, he's, what he's trying to do here is he's trying to give everything a name. Oh, these things belong together. Let me call them this. These things all belong together. Let me call that, these things this. And that's what he's doing. And that's what we see here. And some of these things are more meaningful than others. 
and more clear than others, but he's calling everything a personality trait. But some are more important than others. Some are more permanent, some are less permanent. Some are due to biology, some are innate, some are environmental, okay? And that's what he did. And it seems really uh, like he overdid it. He overdid it with the classification. There are probably not that many different kinds of traits, okay? It's just that he's giving everything a name. Some of those things are just not personality traits. They are just uh, things that have to do with the body, okay? Like a drive, he called, like I said, he called those uh, ergs, right? It's not a personality trait. It's just something about our biology and how it works, okay? Cattell also has stages of personality, believe it or not. It is not necessary, by the way, for these trait theories to actually have stages of personality. This is something that looks like it's left over from the other theories, right? Remember, Freud's theory was a stage theory, and all the, all the Neo-Freudians had stages. And, we, and then we got to Allport, and he started the whole trait thing, and he still had stages. And now we have Cattell, which is continuing with the whole trait approach, and, it's, and still has stages, okay? But we'll get to other trait theories that are more, uh, that are more simple and more about traits, and they will no longer refer to any stages. So eventually we'll get past this. Okay, this is just a transition here where they're still, they're still talking about stages. Okay, because they feel a need to basically copy the people who came before them or, or say things that are similar. Of course, so here are Cattell's stages of personality. So the first stage he called infancy, birth to six years of age. He called that infancy. Um, two to six years of age, most people wouldn't call that infancy. More like early childhood, that's what, the way we, what we call it in, uh, in uh, developmental psychology. But he called, you know, birth to about six years of age infancy. It just means you're very young, okay? You're like an infant, okay? The child is influenced by the parents, right? And siblings, there's weaning and there's toilet training. So this is a time when basically, uh, you don't, you're not driven a lot by who you are and what you think. It's more the influence of the parents, right? And what's happening around you. You're, you're kind of like an infant, okay? And you don't have much control over your own body, okay? So that's, you know, you can't really have exercise much control over that. And then uh, your parents kind of tell you what to do or they, you know, they raise you, they wean you, they potty train you, those kind of things. So he called that infancy. You're an infant. You're just being driven here and there by things you can't really help. You can have feelings or, or of security or insecurity depending on how good of a job the parents do. We talked about a lot about things like that. Um, it affects your attitudes toward authority. We talked about that, how you, if you have good relationships early on, you're more likely to have good relationships down the road. Uh, the ego and the superego uh, develop, okay? Uh, the ego, remember, is that that sense of, uh, that means I or me, right? That's the part of you that thinks, right? Toward the later part of infancy, that's when you really understand that you're something different, right, from others, right? Um, and your superego, Actually, your ego develops earlier, you know, uh, closer to age four, three, around there. It starts with uh, self-awareness, but the superego develops later, closer to age four, six, uh, because your superego, remember, has to do with uh, things that you learn from parents and society, rules, right? What you should do, what you should not do. That develops a little bit later, but all these things happen during the stage that he called infancy. Uh, childhood, he called childhood six to 14. Okay, <clears throat> there's a growing trend toward independence. Children um, basically be, uh, you know, uh, peers become more influential up at about age six, right? Children could have friends before that, but before that, it's like your friends are anybody who's in your class, anybody who's near you, right? But about age six, peers become basically more important and friendships become more real and based on similarities, right? And I things you do together rather than just anybody, right? So, uh, so yeah, there's a trend, more a trend toward independence, right? More wanting to be with other people, hang out with peers, play with people like you, less with parents. They'll still play with their parents, but they wanna be more with people who are like themselves, right? So growing independence from parents uh, and identification with peers, uh, few psychological problems, um, especially, well, uh, more identification with peers, especially when you get to become a teenager, 12, 13, 14, I mean, there you're practically an adolescent and children want, he called this childhood basically, have a very strong need to just be with others who are like them. And that is just going to keep increasing. 
into adulthood and eventually they live, leave mommy and daddy behind, okay? So greater trend toward independence, right? Identifying more with people who are like themselves, their peers, right? And, and that will then develop into true friendships and even romantic relationships down the road. Few psychological problems. According to, uh, to Cattell, uh, childhood is basically usually a, a very good time for children, right? They're not really stressed out. They're not really anxious. Uh, they play and they learn and they have friends. It's supposed to be a happy time. That's what your childhood is supposed to be. Keep in mind though that that is kind of a biased way of looking at things. Keep in mind that all these people were, whose theories we're reading were pretty much all of them upper class. Childhood can be a stressful time, a difficult time for some children, okay? Um, you know, not all children are privileged, but that was his own kind of biased viewpoint. But this is supposed to be a happy time. And I would agree that if things do go well during childhood, it is supposed to be a happy time when you don't really have that many problems. You plan, you learn, you have friends, sure, you go to school and stuff, and maybe you don't like it as much, but it's supposed to be a relatively happy time. I do agree that if things go well, it's supposed to be relatively happy, but it's not the experience of all children. Okay, uh, and then there's adolescence, 14 to 23. Think about that, it goes until like 23 years of age. Adolescence, he considered that a very troublesome and stressful stage, right? When there are, where kids start to act up and start challenging their parents, may even start doing things uh, that they shouldn't do, engaging in delinquent behavior, maybe smoking and drinking before they're even able to uh, legally, right? They can develop emotional disorders, right? Have more problems with anxiety and depression. Uh, and anger and things like that. Delinquency can become a problem. Conflicts based on independence where you're challenging your parents. You wanna go out, hang out with your friends. Maybe you wanna start dating. Your parents don't wanna let you. So there can be conflicts with independence, right? Self-assertion, you asserting yourself, saying, hey, you know, I'm my own person. You know, you gotta give me some freedom. You can't just keep me locked up in here, right? Sex may develop, right, with relationships. Uh, closer to the latter stage, right? Actually, it, it's, it's basically, uh, for Americans, about 16 seems to be the average um, but for some it's later, for some it's earlier, you know, but yes, sex may develop and actually probably has developed by the time you're in your 20s. Believe it or not, Asian Americans, uh, Asian people in general, they start later, you know, closer to their 20s, okay? Uh, very different culture there. But that he called adolescence, troublesome, stressful stage where children act up and cause a lot of problems basically and develop emotional problems, psychological problems, right? But think about that, it goes until 23. What Cattell is saying here is that when you're even, uh, when you're like 20, 21, 22, 23, technically you may not be a teenager anymore, but you are still acting like one according to Cattell. Remember when you were 21, 22, 23, what did you wanna do, right? You wanted to hang out with your friends. You wanted to party, right? You wanted to have a good time. You're still acting like an adolescent. Cattell called that adolescence you're basically still not really an adult. You're not acting like one at that age. And then we have stage four, which is maturity, 23 to 50 years of age. That's the, that's the stage that I'm in, according to Cattell, right? Uh, it's a, supposed to be a very productive time, right? Where you establish your career, right? You get a job and you work at a job, hopefully something uh, useful and something worthwhile, right? You get married, you have kids, you start a family, right? It's a very productive time for work, and raising a family, right? Personality becomes less flexible during this time, okay? You just don't really, uh, you know, um, have, uh, you know, that much freedom anymore. You know, you have to go to work. You know, you have a family you need to take care of and you're responsible to. So your personality is less flexible. It's more about being mature. I have to work, I, you know, and I have to work hard. I have to take care of my kids. I have to do what's best for my family, things like that, right? Parting isn't so much a priority more. Being spontaneous and just taking up and taking off and just leaving on the spur of the moment, like that's not good, right? That's not mature. Not good for the family, right? Few changes in interest, right? This is when you're more stable. You have to be for the good of your marriage and your family. He called that maturity. This is when you really settle down, so to speak. You settle down and you stop acting so irresponsible. That's why they call it when you settle down, right? You get married right? You also settle down emotionally and behavior-wise, right? You start, you stop doing, you know, all those dumb things that you used to do, like stay up too late and party too hard and drink too much and things like that. Some people still do that, by the way, it can be irresponsible, but it's supposed to be a time when you are more mature and you behave more responsibly.
And that's, you know, that's the stage that I'm, that I'm in. And I'm trying to be as responsible as I can. But I still went through that adolescence where I cared about other things. I didn't really get into smoking and drinking that much. But yeah, I did want to party. I did want to hang out with my friends and have a good time and things like that. I wasn't as extreme as some people. But we all kind of go through that adolescent stage where we want to have fun. And it's, it's, it's less about following rules and more about having fun. Maturity, it's more about following the rules and doing what's right, doing what's good for your family. And then you enter late maturity, 50 to 65, right? That's, that's late, that he called that late maturity. Here, your personality begins to change because your physical, social, uh, because of physical, social, and psychological changes. So physically, you begin to change 50 to 65. You no longer have all that energy. You get tired more easily. If you haven't been taking care of yourself, you can have health problems. Your health declines, attractiveness declines. You just don't look that good, uh, as good as you did when you're in your 50s, 60s, as you did when you were in your 20s or even your 30s or even your 40s. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you that from 40 to 60, there's a huge change in your looks. Start your 40s, you don't look that bad. By the time you get to 60, 65, you're going to look old, a lot different, a lot less attractive. Okay, That's just the reality. Unless you have surgery, of course, and you're rich and you can do things like that. And that's, there's a reason why rich people, especially celebrities, look so good because they're cheating, so to speak. They have surgery and they Botox, and all this stuff, different things, things that basically smooth away the wrinkles, right? Most of us can't afford that stuff. But there'll be social changes as well, right? Late maturity, uh, you may, you know, closer to the end of the stage, you'll retire, you know? And uh, when you retire, you'll see how many changes that's going to cause right? All of a sudden, your identity is going to have to change because you won't no longer define yourself according to your job because you don't do that anymore. Your friends will change. They'll be different because a lot of your friends you don't realize are work-related, and now you won't see them so much anymore. So all that changes, right? You're, you know, psych there's psychological changes as well, right? Um, where, you know, your, your personality changes, where uh, you prefer to do different things than you did when you were younger. Yeah, research shows that actually men actually become a, a bit uh, more soft, you could say, or a bit more emotional, more caring late in their old age. You know, and not as aggressive, not as assertive, not as in your face, screw you kind of thing, right? They, they mellow out a little bit. And by the way, women actually uh, uh, is a little bit of the opposite women challenge you a little bit more as they get older, right? Especially when they've been with their husband a long time. When they get older, they don't want to take your crap anymore, you know? Uh, they'll stand out more for themselves when they, get up, when they get older. As you decline, it seems that they basically start to speak up more for themselves and, uh, and be more assertive and take your crap less as, as the husband. They start to do that. My wife started doing that way earlier, <laughs> It seems my wife's been doing that for a long time after the kids were born, after the second kid, right? It's like, all right, you're not the priority anymore. But that happens to women, okay? They become a bit more assertive. They challenge their husbands more, you know, even if their husband might have been kind of dominant, right? Men mellow out a little bit and women kind of then take the reins a little bit more and become a bit more assertive. That happens, okay? Um, so you may re-examine your values, right? Especially if you have like a a midlife crisis, right? You may think about whether you like your life or you need to make changes, right? You look for a new self, right? Because uh, things have changed. You know, when you're in this late maturity, right? You may be nearing the end of your career or maybe have retired and uh, you're no longer the same person. Now you have to find other things to care about, other things that motivate you. And that means a new self. Old age, 65 and onward, uh, is a different time, usually not a very good time, right? Uh, you have to adjust to losses. During old age, uh, you'll see people that will start dying around you. You'll lose friends and loved ones, family members. And you have to adjust to this. Death of loved ones, uh, yeah, retirement, you're probably retired during this time. And that's also a loss of status. Uh, for some people, a, a loss of income um, because Often when you retire, you get less money than you were making, right? And now you're on a fixed income and you're not going to get those increases anymore. So there are losses. You have to adjust to loss of status. Yes, you're no longer that VP or, you know, or, or whatever you were, that policeman. Um, now you're just, you know, uh, some 
some average Joe or something like that. You don't have that status anymore. You're not that important anymore because you don't have that job. And by the way, your spouse will tell you that and will let you know that you are not the only one who matters and you don't, you're not that, you're not that person anymore. Lo there may be even loneliness and insecurity. You know, you might find yourself alone, um, you know, where your spouse died or something like that. Or even if your, your spouse is still there, but you can still be lonely because your children have grown up and they're out of the house and, uh, and you're lonely and they don't see you that much. They don't visit you that much. That's the reality is that children have their own lives and most of them, they won't see you that much. They might come around, you know, around the holidays, you'll probably see them, right? Uh, but, and birthdays, holidays, that kind of stuff, but not that much. Some people are so unlucky, they don't even see their children, you know, during holidays, because they live in another country, another part of the world. Uh, or some of them, you know, just don't make the effort to fly across the country, whatever, it depends on how close they are, right? Uh, as far as distance, you know, uh, you know, uh, how physically close they are, you know, with, uh, with distance, right? Uh, insecurity can set in, right? Where no, you're no longer so sure about yourself. Your health is declining, your intelligence is declining, and you're not so sure anymore, right? About, uh, about the future and about how, you know, about whether things are gonna be okay. Uh, I will tell you though, though, though that this is, uh, it's outdated, you know? Uh, Things don't have to be that bad anymore. We are healthier now. We live uh, into old age and we're likely to stay healthier longer. This was more true during Cattell's time, but nowadays because of advances in medicine and in drugs and things like that, we are leaving, living longer and healthier. So a lot of uh, senior citizens are still healthy and will be healthy into their 70s or maybe even their 80s. So this doesn't have to be this way. This is a bit outdated. Assessment, when it comes to Cattell's theory, um, there's something known as the uh, 16 personality, personality factor questionnaire. That's basically the questionnaire that assesses, um, that has to do with, uh, with Cattell's theory, that looks at, uh, you know, 16 different personality factors that he considered important. And if you get that uh, address there, right there, that uh, HTTP, whatever it is, copy and paste that, it'll take you there. You can click, 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 right? And it'll tell you, um, you know, how you, you uh, score on those 16 personality factors. Uh, Cattell made use of uh, uh, twin studies, okay? He looked at twins to see how, uh, how alike they are. So he used twins to assess the relative importance of heredity and environment. Which personality traits are more environmental, which are basically more biological? If twins are very alike and a certain personality trait, uh, that suggests that it's more biological. There's a stronger case to be made if for that it's biological, that it's genetic. If the, tin, if the twins were actually raised in different households, let's say they were adopted by different families and they're still very alike and their personality, that suggests that that's heavily biological. So he compared twins that were reared together in the same household and those that were reared apart in different households. And he compared them with people who are not twins, right? Regular brother and sister or brother and brother, sister and sister um, that would rear together and apart. He looked at that to see uh, you know, what it tells him about whether things are genetic or not. And according to uh, you know, what he found, uh, his studies, it suggests that 80% of intelligence, for instance, uh, is genetic or being uh, like timid or shy, uh, about 80% of it is genetic or how, or the opposite, how bold you are, about 80% is, is genetic as well. Intelligence is the really controversial thing. Um, Cattell believed it was mostly uh, genetic, it's biological. Environment does matter and most people believe it matters more than that. Most people believe it's about 50-50, maybe 60-40 around there. Yeah, it depends on who you talk to, which one has the advantage. But Cattell believed it was mostly uh, genetic, according to the studies he did. But you were better at uh, assessing these things uh, uh, nowadays, by the way, uh, of uh, determining uh, genetic, you know, how genetic something is or how environmental it is. During Cattell's time, it was probably a bit inaccurate. Re more recent research suggests that it's, it's more like 60-40, 50-50. Uh, assessment in Cattell's theory, other things that he used, um, he looked at uh, what he called life records or L data. 
Uh, ratings of behaviors observed in real life situations, such as the classroom, the office. Uh, life records are basically uh, when other people rate you on things, how well behaved you are, you know, how, how well you, you, know, you do your job right, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. He called that uh, uh, life records, okay? Um, it's what basically um, ratings of behaviors uh, from things that you do. How well you do in the classroom, how well you do at work, things like that. And then he also has questionnaires, Q data, where the research participants, they rate themselves, okay? With life data, it's just information about you that other people record, basically. Uh, questionnaires is, is basically information that you record yourself, where you answer certain questions, right? Um, you rate yourself on how aggressive you are, how honest you are, et cetera, right? Uh, that can suffer from dishonesty. People can easily lie on those things. Uh, and it might only provide, it might only, uh, um, you know, show like uh, superficially um, what people are like. So, and, and, and it's only superficial self-awareness. In other words, that people are not always aware of what they're really like. These questionnaires may not capture that. You know, like uh, people can be very superficial like uh, as, as to how they uh, answer those things. Like most people consider themselves honest, right? And hardworking and things like that. But the reality is that a lot of people are not. But people are only superficially aware of themselves, right? And when they answer these questionnaires, uh, that's what you get, this superficial kind of self-awareness. There's also a personality tests that he called T-data. Questionnaires are basically where you rate yourself on certain things. Personality tests are different. Those are, that's T data. He called these objective tests that were developed by Cattell and others. Tests like the TAT, which we talked about a long time ago, not a long time ago, but early in the semester. That's a thematic app perception test, right? Personality tests are tests where they're, they're more like tests and, and less like questionnaires. In other words, you, have, you answer certain questions, you respond to certain things, and it's not clear what exactly the test is getting at. But depending on how you score, that might say something about how aggressive you are, how honest you are, things like that. It's more of a test and less about, I think I'm honest. It's, it's less of you rating yourself directly. It's more indirect where you answer certain questions and the way you answer the questions reveals what you're like. So it's a test in which participants don't really know what is being assessed, what is being tested. They're just taking this test and you don't tell them that it's about this or this or that it has to do with this theory. They take the test and the way they answer the questions suggests whether they are honest, whether they are aggressive. Those are personality tests. So life records, uh, questionnaires, Q data, right? And personality tests, call that T data, T for test. L data, Q data, T data. Um, another theory starts after this. And you know what, we're far enough. We only have like 20 minutes left to discuss things. Um, so we'll actually stop there. Cattell's theory is the theory that takes up the most uh, amount of time for this chapter. All the other ones are going to be a, are going to be much more brief. Okay, they don't get into stages or anything like that. So we'll talk about those theories later. Okay, so we'll actually stop here. This is a good place to stop.